Flash of Fire this morning's edition, Wednesday, April 20th, with the good wishes of Face the Trading Basic Needs Trust Fund and the flow. This is how we flow. In studio this morning, we have the Honorable Saboto Caesar, the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, Rural Transformation, Industry and Labor. And via Zoom, we have seismologist Roderick Short. Good morning to you, gentlemen. Welcome to the program this morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I know that persons are, are following not only in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but in the diaspora. This is a very well listened to program, very informative, keeping the nation, the region and the world updated as to what is taking place with Lasso Frere. This morning, Roderick, you are there? Yes, I'm here. Good morning, everyone. Yes, so we will go right into your presentation and then we'll take a few questions after. So it's over to you. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. The um, volcano has remained quiet basically since yesterday, basically since the, um, the last explosive activity. We've had only a few of the earthquakes that we had during the explosions. So it is still quiet, and, and the longer this goes on, the, the better it is. It, it, it is beginning to look as if it is dying down. Yesterday, we had activity that was not directly associated with the volcano, it's more secondary activity. Um, about 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning yesterday, we had several lahars due to heavy rainfall, and these affected quite a number of the valleys around the volcano. And then we saw a, another feature, which I don't think we've seen before. After the rain had passed, we could see a lot of steam coming out of one of the valleys. And I think it was the Walibu. Mm -hmm. And it was quite impressive, the amount of steam that was rising up. And this was caused by the, the runoff from the rain getting into the pyroclastic deposits. Because although these deposits on the surface are, are cool, if you've got a good thickness of deposits that have come down, the deposits at depth are still very, very hot. And the water from the rain was getting into those deposits and basically flashing to steam and creating this big white steam cloud coming out of the valley. I don't know if that was seen in any other valleys, but it, it could well have been. And it just illustrates the sort of the power involved in this volcano that we've still got heat in these deposits around the volcano. Okay, um, so yeah, that's, that's the situation as it is today. What is the composition of the, these la, the laha you're talking about and how dangerous is it to uh, <coughs> human, to agriculture? Sorry, the, yeah, the, the laha the, is, is when we have heavy rainfall and it brings material down in the valleys and it's very, very erosive. It will cut its way through channels. It will, it, it, it gets clogged up with uh, vegetation, it brings trees down and then it can end up taking away bridges and, and things like that. But the lahars are, are restricted to the valleys, so they're only a danger in the valleys, and they're restricted to times when we've had heavy rainfall. So it's fairly predictable where the effects and when the effects of the lahars are going to be. It's, it's very interesting, Stuart, that you, you mention that you observe that when the, the water went through the valleys, you saw the steam. And you, you highlighted the, the point, very important point, that the pyroclastic flows would have left certain deposits that are still extremely hot. Now, that goes to show that in any assessment of damage and loss to the forest or to surrounding areas, that the... the the damage basically cannot be quantified now because the impact is ongoing. Because once there is heat, then you will find further trees being destroyed and further impact on flora and fauna. It, but the heat is very localized. I mean, the pyroclastic flows are, the, the deposits that are left over are restricted to the, the sort of bottom of the valleys and the higher slopes of the volcano. And they're not going to move. So, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not really been involved in the assessment of damage from, from these flows in terms of agriculture. 
But um, I would have thought you could start as soon as it is, as it is safe to go to these places. I mean, we still feel it's not safe to go into the red zone to do work. So that, I think, is, is what would hold back any assessment more than the potential damage from the heat in these flows. OK. What is the difference? That's a question coming in on WhatsApp. What is the difference between the long and short period in terms of hybrid earthquakes and seismic tremors? What's the difference between hybrid earthquakes and the seismic tremors? Gosh, I could go on for hours about this. Um, when we record earthquakes, the signals that we record have certain frequencies. Now, we all know about frequencies in audio and music we listen to. These are just a different frequency range. And we use the word period. Period is actually the inverse of frequency. So long period means low frequency. Short period means high frequency. So the long period earthquakes have got lower frequencies than the things that we call volcano tectonics. The hybrid earthquakes are basically a, a, a mixture, halfway point between the long period and the volcano tectonic, in that they contain some elements of one and some elements of the other. And then the tremor is basically a, a continuous shaking of the ground, probably caused by these long period earthquakes. But the, the, the bottom line is that they're just classifications. We can see distinct types of signals and we can put them into these classes, which we have given names for scientific reasons. And by counting how many of them are in, in each class, it can tell us about the type of activity that's going on at the volcano. So it's very, very useful for us scientifically to identify these different earthquakes. Yes, yeah, so I basically have no further questions. Um, I'm, I, is there another question I coming in? Quest, I have a question coming in on WhatsApp. Yes. Uh, uh, what could the steaming from the two vents that are present now mean for the explosive phase of the volcano? What could it, this, okay, you got it. Yeah, okay. it, it doesn't really mean anything. It, it's, it's an observation and it, maybe it's slightly unusual but the, we suspect that these two vents are actually connected not far below the surface. So in terms of what the volcano does, it's really no different if there's one vent or if there's two vents. Um, this is just something that's caused by the, the superficial deposits in the crater. Maybe there was one vent and it got blocked up and they decided to try and come out beside it in another vent. But it, it really doesn't tell us anything about what's going to happen with the volcano as a whole. It's just a, a very localised phenomenon, which is of interest to us as scientists, but really doesn't have any bearing on the, the hazards and risks from the volcano to the, the population. And uh, final question coming in here from WhatsApp. I uh, know you've been talking about Laha coming down the rivers. Someone is asking, can Lahas create permanent land or they just uh, destroy uh, or runs down the river or the valleys over time? Can they create permanent land? I, I, I guess they can. I mean, the, it's just basically water moving material. So it's brought it from up in the mountain and it's going to deposit it somewhere. Now, if it's depositing it at sea, I doubt if that's permanent because it would be washed away by, by, by the sea. But it will tend to fill up some of the valleys it may clog some of the drain ways, the, 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 the drains, the, the, the ways the rivers go. And I think lahars can definitely create changes in the land. So they may create changes in the, the, the river distribution, in the topography, but I don't think they're going to create new land out at sea, because I think that would be eroded away by the sea, um, you know, within a few years. All right, so what plans or what is the schedule for today, if any, uh, in terms of visits to the volcano? OK, well, I mean, mainly, our main thing is, is to keep watching the volcano, make sure all our equipment is working and keep recording and to be able to react to anything, because that's very, very important. But we have a couple of teams in the fields who are out looking at some of the deposits, both from the Lahars and the pyroclastic flows. And we're also working closely with various government authorities and the telecoms to try and restore our stations at Fancy and OEM. Um, we've got two seismic stations up there which haven't been working for a while, and we really would like to get them back. But it's a long way to go, and, and to drive up to Fancy, it's very difficult for a start. You can do it in a four-wheel drive, 
but it's also very difficult to escape if you want to get out quickly. So I think uh, a, a sea approach, getting a boat to go in, is a much safer approach. So we're, we're, I'm not sure, I don't think we're doing that today, but we're, we're talking about it. But we're doing small bits of field work today. All right. Well, let me thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Stewart, for checking in with us today. And of course, you stay safe and we'll check in with you tomorrow for another update. Thank you so much. Okay, no problem. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. And of course, we have in studio the Honorable Saboto Caesar, Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, Rural Transformation, Industry, and Labor. A lot of stuff to, <laughs> to deal with. <laughs> uh, but of course, we'll talk agriculture, we'll talk fisheries this morning as it relates to the eruption. What has the ministry been doing since uh, the eruption? I know there's a lot with love boxes <coughs> and all that, dealing with the animals that left behind. Uh, probably can get into what, what, what a little of what uh, the agriculture department has been doing. Yes, I, I always like to frame the discussion within the particular context of the, the work mm -hmm. and the, the, the programs that we have. But before I, I go into to that segment of this morning's presentation, I, I wish to, to thank all the, the governments, international organizations, persons in St. Vincent and the Grenadines who continue to join hands and hearts in solidarity to work as we bring together a framework to address the resultant implications of the explosive eruption of La Souffre. You know, from the, the person who's walking on, on the port who turns up on time to ensure that the vessel is properly cleared, the workers in Nemo, Basically, we have an extended front line where that front line of workers, not only persons in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but throughout the world, there are persons who are in many different countries putting together packages, working with different ministries and stakeholders. For example, I know that the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, AICA, doing a lot of work in Argentina to ensure that we have a an excellent framework in the rebuilding and recovery process now we outlined as early as december last year a a, a four phase program to address issues touching and concerning food production productivity in st vincent and the grenadines should there be an explosive eruption so i want persons who are listening to to be aware and take comfort in the fact that we were very prepared. Being proactive. We were very proactive and uh, we had many meetings early, early in the year. And you know something, when you're having these meetings and you do not know a date, some persons may say in the meeting, we may be preparing for something that may never happen. <laughs> but I really want to thank the technicians in the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, fisheries, rural transformation, industry, and, and labor for the preparatory work that went into having the country very well organized and prepared for this eventuality, which actually took place. So the phase one was always to do an assessment as to where the assets of the government in the red zone, where they, they were, mm -hmm. and their vulnerability. So should there be an explosive eruption, taking into consideration the historical context, what took place in 1902, what took place in 1979, we had identified that there are some government assets that we had to move and move early. We also gave the information out to the private sector and the persons who are private sector stakeholders in the red zone we identified also the levels of vulnerability mm -hmm. and we had started to work with them. So, for example, we had tagged a significant percentage of the animals in the red zone long before we had the explosive eruption. So, persons who were advised to let their animals loose, when they, if, when they return from the shelters, when the all clay is given, at least you may have a tag to work with. So we had prepared from a, a, a livestock standpoint for the private sector significantly. And for persons who are not aware as to how the livestock for the government is strategically placed, mm -hmm. a lot is in the red zone. So you have the Belmont on the, the leeward side of the country, 
And on the windward side, the Rabaka Farms, one of the major pool, gene pools for livestock in St. Vincent and the Grandines owned by the government. We also have the Biotechnology Center, which was constructed jointly with government and people of, of Taiwan, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And that is basically the, the, ho the, the storehouse for a significant percentage of our germplasm material in the country. So when we had an approach to up food security during the period of COVID, and you heard about the thousands of seedlings that did, all of these were basically being prepared at the Orange Hill Center, which is in the red zone. So we were able to, to move out a lot of these prior to the eruption, the explosive part of the eruption. But there were just some things that we could not move. Right. And, <laughs> and because of that, we have suffered significant damage to a lot of our infrastructural assets. Yesterday, a decision was made to do an assessment on the, the greenhouse park in Montreal and we were already in discussions with a private sector stakeholder producer of vegetables for that person to basically manage the greenhouse park but that was before we had the explosive eruption okay. now we've lost our assets in the in the red zone at the biotechnology lab we are in conversation now because we may actually need as a government to use that facility as whether it's an interim or medium term or long term, we don't know. But we have to get the government's assets and the infrastructure for the ministry up and running. I just want persons who are listening to be aware of this. Because, you know, there is this rule in, in first aid that you have to make sure that you are secured first right. before you go out to help. Because if you go out to help and you're not secured, then you could have two casualties. So we are working during this period the next two weeks or so to ensure that we have the resources available for all those assets, the infrastructure that we had in the red zone, that they are moved to safer areas whereby they can begin to, to function and we can have the, the services rendered to, to farmers, even though persons who will be benefiting mm -hmm. Um, and not focus on persons in the red zone because a lot of the persons in the red zone are in, in shelters. A very interesting observation, we had a very interesting observation yesterday and uh, when you move assets of the state from a particular area, we have to be aware, it's a very sensitive issue, that persons from that particular area would have worked at that particular facility. So let's use, for example, the tissue culture lab in, in Orange Hill. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to say to move the services to Montreal, but then the persons who were really trained to operate it are persons from Sandy Bay, persons from Owea, persons from Georgetown. And what we are going to do is, well, we, we started the process already. We know where all the workers are, which shelters they are in, and we are going to organize to have them picked up to, to be taken to work. Okay. So, so that we are, you, you could see we're returning to a, a state of normalcy as it Slowly. pertains to the services to, to be rendered. And we will take these persons back home on an afternoon. So we plan to have a bus probably going from the, the furthest on the windward side, which would be the Diamond Village Primary School shelter, come to North Union, come to Baibu. And we will tell persons where are the pickup points so that they could come out to the main road. And we have that transportation system. So we are studying the thing very carefully. We are working it out. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, or biotechnology lab, I was advised by the chief agriculture officer that in a few weeks we will be able to render services. It was very instructive the last time I was on the program that um, professors noted that we should try to see how much we can do in the, in the safer zones as it pertains to the rebuilding efforts immediately right. because it's... it's really unpredictable as to what could take place in the in the red zone and you noted a while ago when we had the presentation by permission mm -hmm. 
but from a ministry of agriculture standpoint we have left that purely within the purview of of nemo because the last thing that we want to do is to as a is as a ministry be be organizing for persons to go into a zone and we not knowing the how unpredictable things can take place in that zone so so basically we have, we have allowed nemo to conduct its work and we have not trespassed on <laughs> on the authorization from nemo but i know that there have been persons who were given limited access by nemo from time to time to to go and to assist in different ways with the animals but this is something that we are leaving to national security and nemo okay. what what we have advised however is that persons who are purchasing animals because a lot of the, the butchers will venture into this area on a, a weekly basis and now we are touching on concerning the issue of food security right because the butchers would go there, buy the animals um, on a Thursday, slaughter them on a on a Saturday, and provide much needed protein for the rest of the of the country. And as I have been advised, this is worked out on a case by case basis between the police and and Nemo. One thing that we were involved in, though, is that many of the farmers have a contractual relationship with the exporter of cattle to Grenada. Mm -hmm. And he left St. Vincent and the Grenadines I think about two or three days before the explosive eruption took place. So he was due back in St. Vincent and the Grenadines about two months from now. Right. But because many of the farmers in the shelters were pressured for, for feed for the animals, they were not there to take care of the animals. They contacted him and he was mobilized and he's now actually in St. Vincent and the Grenadines to move out what we will hope will be probably the last shipment for this year. Because even though he comes every quarter, mm -hmm. we now have to do a stock assessment based on the impact of the displacement of persons, the impact on the national herd so that we can have a structured rebuilding process and uh, i have an uh, i have the advice from the the chief vet mm -hmm. to table at cabinet today as to how we rebuild the national herd and uh, i just want to to say a bit without saying too much that it may cause for a need whereby he may not be able to export after this particular shipment for the rest of the year again i don't know when we complete the quantitative assessment what would be the, the result but i'm just explaining to persons in the general public because persons would be seeing cattle being exported over the weekend and they may wonder they, they have always raised the question we are sending away the food but we know and we are keeping a very clear a very careful eye yeah. quantitatively and qualitatively on on the national herd we've been talking a while on uh animals and in, in i know you've been making the wrongs and your personal assessment what impact has uh, the volcano have had on the food stock agriculture um per se and especially in the red zone yes well in in measuring the impact there are different indices that you will look at for example if you go to the port port kingston and you do an assessment you remember two weeks ago, we had a, a very large quantity of goods being exported. Mm -hmm. So the ministry then did the background research and we realized that even with, with heavy ash fall in certain areas, the root crops mm -hmm. below ground, once reaped and prepared, that they were fit for market. However, yesterday, whilst in a meeting, we received a call from several bakeries. We received a call from one bakery first and about three other bakers called saying that there's a scarcity of dry coconuts so that they had to cut some of the lines, some of the pastry lines that they were accustomed to. You know, we love the little red belly and the coconut slice <laughs> right, and the coconut right. tart. They said that, that they could not 
get the quantities that they, they usually ob obtain. So here we are seeing as we go along, um, the banana industry, banana and planting industry took a very hard beating. The, the heavy ash fall on the leaves created a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it rained, it, it augmented that. And a lot of the, we had a lot of leaf loss. And, you know, that will definitely affect the ability of the, the plant in the, in the fruiting stage. Now, so we have already witnessed a, a significant reduction in the export to the region of plantings and bananas. And because you have a reduction in the, in the output of plantings, you would have a knock-on effect mm -hmm. with the agro-processors who process plantings. So you're talking now about the planting chips industry. Because there's a planting chips industry in St. Vincent yeah, and the Grenadines. They, sure. <laughs> there are over 40-something different planting chip makers who you meet them, they have their products in the supermarkets. Mm -hmm. So, and it will further have another impact whereby the, you, you have the, the traffickers mm -hmm. who continue to move plantings. And uh, the, the Love Box initiative has started. And the, this initiative basically is a we have products purchased from the farmers because there are some farmers who may be in a, a shelter and they are from, let's say, from the, from the orange zone. And uh, they can't get into the hassle of taking these commodities to their traditional markets. Uh -huh. Therefore, the government is creating an opportunity for them to easily market those products. And... When we had, during the COVID period, a similar program, we had different buying depots. So we, we bought stuff in, in Rosebank, in Rillan Hill, <clears throat> in Lacqua, in Lauders, and also in Langley Park. Now, Langley Park is out of commission. Rosebank is out of commission. Rillan Hill is being used for shelter purposes and other relief issues. And uh, the private sector is there in Lauders. So we are now restrained to Lacroix. And uh, I, I visited that area yesterday where they were buying a lot of um, produce. And a lot of the produce bought there are taken to the shelters. Because, you know, from, from growing up, you don't eat rice in St. Vincent and the Grenadines all week. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. You, you eat rice. You eat rice. And, 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 and I know that the housewives who, who, are, who are listening, you don't want to hear the um, complaint. Every day is rice, rice, rice. 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 <laughs> so, so we recognize in this, we have sent a lot of the, the ground provision and the, the plantains, the bananas to these shelters so that persons who are preparing the meals we don't have the, 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 the pressure in being creative. So that is assisting us significantly. And I also want to note that I am advised that two butchers are supplying different shelters with meat. It, it also means, and we have to extrapolate this to mean that persons who hitherto may have bought imported chicken on a large scale because they are now in a shelter and beef is being produced and it's local beef mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we can see a, a need for us not to export after this particular shipment to Grenada more of the animals because we'll be consuming a lot more of these animals because we have over 85 shelters and we have thousands of persons in these shelters. And at the end of the day, food security is something that has to be constantly managed. I, I explained a few days ago to someone when they, 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 they had a, a, a critical stance as to whether or not we should be exporting ground provision at this point in time. And I told them that that week we had about 50,000 pounds of ginger available and farmers were reaping their ginger when you look at a at a population of 110,000 persons you probably might, might need for that week only a thousand pounds of ginger if so much it's not christmas where you're making out the ginger beer 
And um, ginger is not really a feature in our Vincentian cuisine mm. to a large extent. So what would you do with the, the balance of the ginger? You have to export it. And, and it only goes to show how deep-seated and how grounded and how well-organized the agriculture sector in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is. And sometimes we may just see a plot of land there and think, well, that's the extent of the agriculture. But there are hundreds, there are thousands of persons who go to work on a daily basis to ensure that there's food security, not only in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but also in the sub-region and in, in, the rest of the, um, in the rest of the region. Now, the, there is an issue that we are facing currently, and it has to do with, with dogs on the loose in the, in the red zone, and it's creating significant damage to, to animals. And it's a matter that we are going to work with the several agencies on the ground to address this matter because the owners are basically in the shelters, the dogs are loose, and their, their feeding program has been disrupted. Mm -hmm. And they, they have adopted a, a, a hunting stance. And when you look at the value of the livestock, significant value of the livestock, we cannot afford to have that to be taking the feed to the animals, taking care of them, taking the water to these animals, and then having them being destroyed, be, being destroyed by, by dogs. Right. So that's a matter that we are grappling with, and we, we are going to address it in a very sensible way. The, the other issue that I want to, to address is that of the assessment of damage and loss. Mm -hmm. We have started the... The process, the process basically started immediately after the explosive eruption. We have been able to assess a lot of the, the physical damage on agriculture. But when it comes to the damage as it pertains to forest, significant. And I, I, later on this week, I will, be taking, I will be doing an official visit to the leeward side of the country. Mm -hmm. I, I was advised by the forestry department that we lost over 30 acres of forest. And as you listened, Stuart, a bit earlier, right now it's, it's still, we're still in, we should still really be in the assessment stage. stage because he noted that it is very dangerous to go into these areas. Mm -hmm. The question is how long will it be dangerous? When will we get the all clear? I think that we are very far from getting an, an all clear as it pertains to the slopes right. to regenerating um, forests on, on the slopes of the volcano. So it, it's, it's really a continuous process of assessment. It's going to be very interesting to see how the disruption in the labor force in the red zone would have an impact on agricultural production. Because to go and look at the land and to see the land burnt or to see heavy ash fall on the land, that's one impact. Right. But it also has an impact on labor. And we are working to ensure that we engage agriculture workers and farmers as quickly as possible. Because if you do not do that, you can run the risk mm -hmm. that they may leave. They may leave to go into other productive areas or they may actually leave the country. We have seen an increase in the requests for persons to go on the Canadian Farm Workers Program, for example. And we are seeing it coming out of, of areas that were devastated. So we are looking at all those issues and, and we are managing them. The, the, the other issue has to, to do with what are the immediate short-term work that we, we plan to to address in the green and the yellow zones so that we ensure that food security is maintained. Right. And uh, we are going to go into a national program for seeds, seedlings to be distributed. The issue where we're going to address persons who are not using advanced forms of mechanization, like a man may need a tractor, but he doesn't have the, the finance to, to, to plow the land. Mm -hmm. We are going to plow up as much land as possible. And, and this can be, we could have an arrangement 
as to how we will recover the cost. Okay. But what you're going to witness over the next four months, four to six months, is a lot of lands that you didn't see being worked in the green and the yellow zones. You would see a lot of them being worked up. And uh, we are going to have an, an approach whereby, <clears throat> as I noted earlier, the, the land bank system will be brought into, into full play. And the support systems will be made available for farmers. It will be interesting to, to see whether or not persons from the red zones will be willing to participate in this type of production outside of the red zone because they, we don't know how long persons would be in the shelters. And uh, I highlighted yesterday in, in a meeting that we had that transportation for these farmers would be significant. So let's, let's explain it out as to how it can happen in, in, in reality. So you may have, let's say, 35 farmers at the North Union Secondary School in a shelter, and they are from the red zone. And... Uh, whilst they wait over the next four to six months, there may actually be lands right there in Diamonds right. Or, or in San Susi that we can make available as a part of the land bank program that yeah. they can begin to occupy. So we are thinking short term, we are thinking medium term, but we are also thinking long term. So if, if I don't get any... If, if the news from Stuart for the next few months is that the, the, we, we, we still can't okay, return to the red sure. zone to um, cultivate. You have persons who are actively engaged in cultivation mm -hmm. outside of the red zone. Right. That is the kind of thing. I guess these lands would be used more for short-term crops. For short-term crops. For short-term crops. And um, we, will know, we will know that the persons there would not be able to come up with the financing to, to lease the lands. We don't want to put, put them through the hassle of going to draft the contracts or the, lease, the leases. So we were going to organize all of that centrally for them. Mm -hmm. But we want to have persons actively engaged because it, it's very, very noth noteworthy that even though someone is in a shelter and you're providing for certain, a certain percentage of their needs, mm -hmm. that level of independence and resilience in our farmers, persons are ready and willing to go to work. But the area that they worked traditionally is still unsafe. Right. And we think that it will be a best fit if we can have persons organized and they can become productive, and especially in, th in things and areas that they, they, they are able to do. You, you may find some persons traditionally were, they may have been an arid farmer in the red zone. But the, the soil type in the area and the lands may, may, for potatoes <laughs> conducive and for potatoes. So <laughs> what, what this is leading us to is that starting from Monday of next week, we're going to have a national consultation. Because whilst we have these ideas, we now have to take the ideas to the farmers, to the shelters. We have to have radio programs where persons are beginning to understand. And I'm really happy that I have the opportunity this morning to start to flesh out some of these, these ideas. But we have to take these ideas to the shelters, speak to persons, get the buy-in, if there is going to be a buy-in, and begin the process. One thing I can tell you, as Minister of Agriculture, I'm not sitting down and I'm not waiting. We are pushing, we are advancing, and we are being as creative as we can be, taking into consideration that things are very unpredictable in, 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 in the circumstances. I know you have a cabinet meeting this morning and uh, we're running out of time for the program, but there's a question coming in on Facebook uh, concerning persons who lost animals in the red zone and they're in shelters. Now, if there might be later on a little compensation. There is going to be a holistic recovery effort. I, I heard advanced in the, in the ministry already, and of course, everything I say here is subjected to an overall cabinet decision that will take place down the line. Mm -hmm. But we have to be very clear on something. There is a mantra that we have to rebuild and rebuild better. So... A person who, for example, had a, a farm that may have been a nuisance to a church or a school, 
we are not going to replace that farm to continue to be a nuisance. Fair enough. So we have to do an assessment of where that farmer was, what the farmer was doing. And what I can say in answering that question mm -hmm. is that there will be a very well-planned, structured, and conceived recovery effort to put the farmer within the context of a developmental path mm -hmm. so that they can recover. Um, there are some persons who may have been involved in certain productive activities that from an overall standpoint, it will not be feasible taking into consideration the, the physiological changes in the landscape for them to go back into right. that type of production. So I don't want persons to, to, to think that if you lost a chicken, we're going to give you back a chicken. Or if you lost a goat, we're going to give you back a goat. I just want persons to know that coming out of the consultation that there is going to be a, a new path, a new trajectory for the development and the framing of the agriculture sector. And you may actually find yourself in a discussion where you want to diversify or you want to continue, but to augment your production so that you can be more productive. So that's part coming out of the whole mantra that we have to rebuild and we have to rebuild better. So I don't want persons to think that, okay, I had a, a broken down pen here and, and I want to go back and do the same thing right there. We, we may actually bring in better breeds, different varieties of seeds. Mm -hmm. We may have a market. We are working to create new markets. So this is, this is the angle that, that we are going to take. Final thoughts, final words as we wrap up, uh, Minister Caesar, uh, to farmers out there. <laughs> yes, I, I am very excited. Very excited. Um, it's an exciting period. There are many opportunities that will be presenting themselves, many possibilities. I know that the, the farmers are ready to go. And I, I must say, when I visit the shelters, mm -hmm. the farmers are asking, when are we going to go back to the, when are we going back to the farm? So that's, that's very, very, very impressive. And uh, I, I want farmers to have trust and confidence in, in the process. At the end of the day, whatever we do as a ministry, we have to be guided by NEMO, guided by, by the fact that we have to, to, to protect life. And uh, we have a framework that we'll be bringing to a national consultation, of course, once it's blessed by the um, cabinet. I'm aware that very soon we'll be having a sitting of, of the parliament mm -hmm. that would further discuss some of these, these issues. As soon as I have the all clear from that, we are, are going to hit the ground running. Thank you very much, Minister, for being on the program this morning and all the best for the building and the rebuilding of the agricultural sector here in St. Vincent and the Grandines. Stay safe. Yes. I'm glass of rare face to face uh, Wednesday's edition here. Very good wishes of face trading, basic needs, a trust fund, and the flow. This is how we flow. On the program this morning, we had. Uh, the Honorable Saboto sees the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, Rural Transformation, Industry and Labor. And early in the had an update from Roderick Stewart, seismologist, a team member of LEAD, or that's a team member monitoring the last of Fire Volcano here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being a part of the program. Have a good day. Poverty alleviation through community empowerment. That's the motto of the Basic Needs Trust Fund BMTF located in the Kims Building in Grenville Street, Kingstown. Operating in St. Vincent and the Grenadines since 1979, the Basic Needs Trust Fund is funded by the Government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and the Caribbean Development Bank. Its basic needs focus stands on three solid pillars, skills training, infrastructure development and social development. Chances are, a project in your community was funded by the Basic Needs Trust Fund. It has improved improved access roads, built drains and river defenses, refurbished and provided new facilities in primary and secondary schools, and repaired or constructed preschools, health clinics and community markets. Drop in or call 456-1457 and see what you and BNTF can do for your community. <laughs> If you have one, hold it up.